Banish the thinker. The paragraphs in my letter of dismissal could have been summed up in two words. You're fired. I'd recruited young New Zealanders to work overseas. My boss had received an email from his supervisor in the USA. If he lied about this applicant's credentials, it greatly troubles me how many other underqualified counsellors have been sent over to look after children. Can you drive a boat, I'd said. He had told me his father owned a 17-foot craft. No, replied the applicant. It's about the safety of campers. Life jackets and helmets fastened correctly, hazards eliminated. If you can steer right to left and you know the difference between reverse and forward, you'll learn on the spot. Three months until you go. Can you figure it out on your father's boat? Yes. Great. When you get there, you'll have one week of orientation before the campers arrive. You'll be taught about safety aspects and operations. Camps are always looking for New Zealanders in water sports. I want to get you an excellent job, but you'll have to be ready. Can I make a record that you'll be ready? Yes. Right answer. A month later, the applicant was offered a contract. After two months, he panicked. I can't take the job, he told my boss. I don't know how to drive a boat. The interviewer forced me to lie. When I was fired, I promised myself that I'd never work in an office again. A month or so prior to being dismissed, I began selling books via a mailing list. I decided to expand. I looked online for charity shop locations and drove around various suburbs of Auckland, New Lynn, Mount Roskill, Onihanga, Glen Innes, and Papakura. I scoured opportunity shop shelves for books that I might one day read if I hadn't done so already. I set up a shelf of about 30 books and listed them online at TradeMe, New Zealand's equivalent of eBay, which sold domestically and occasionally to Australia. US contemporary and literary fiction disappeared quickly, especially the literary contemporary crossovers. Ernest Hemingway, Philip Roth, Brett Easton Ellis and Chuck Palahniuk. Popular writers from elsewhere, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Haruki Murakami, and Albert Camus, didn't stay on the shelf for long either. Books were purchased for one or two dollars and were listed at between five and ten dollars depending on their condition. I knew little about first editions and the value of rare books, so I sold via auctions rather than buy now prices. Titles would often surpass ten dollars. In my early selling days, I shifted a copy of John Steinbeck's Cannery Row for $17. With research, perhaps I could have passed some titles on for triple figures. That I'll never know. Overhead included wrapping paper, tape, and petrol. I photographed and listed each book individually. Upon sale, I packaged and sent the book or books ordered. The post office was about one kilometer away and many buyers picked up. Trade Me took 8% of each sale. In order to pay rent and buy books en masse, I worked at Fatso, a DVD rental service where I cleaned the discs and as a security guard at the New Zealand Warriors Rugby League matches. Both jobs were uninspiring and I aspired to expand my business. While I always dreamed of running a brick and mortar second hand store, I couldn't afford rental space nor did I wish to be tied down in New Zealand. Living in the flat above my Greyland basement apartment was another bookseller, Jonathan, who had a monthly stall at the now defunct Craft Bomb. Looking for similar stock, we carpooled to book fairs in Whangaparoa, Mount Eden, and Ellerslie. I was jogging around Western Springs with Jonathan and got my foot stuck in a tram track, which caused me to fall and fracture my ankle. With my brother's assistance, I attended a book fair in Oriwa and with moonboot and crutches, I filled a few boxes. Because of the injury, I had to quit my security job, but continued cleaning DVDs. I had started to write a novel four years earlier and saw the online bookshop as an investment for my future fiction piece. I'd have to expand. Close friends now living in London were scheduled to marry in Mexico. I used the money I'd saved to visit mates in the US prior to the wedding. I made my way to Reno and initially slept on my buddy Darren's floor. I couldn't dwell too long in his one-bedroom apartment, so I used couchsurfing to stay with locals. In Reno, the biggest little city in the world, 
I discovered a plethora of op shops where great books were sold for between 10 and 50 cents. Shelves and rooms of literature in thrift stores were sometimes 10 times the size of those in the op shops I'd frequented in New Zealand. I went to the post office to get shipping quotes. Prices were stacked as the packages could only be sent via airmail. A friend back in New Zealand had a contact who shipped classic cars from Los Angeles to Auckland, and for $100 an item he'd send my friend rare musical instruments. These products couldn't be obtained at home and would cost hundreds of dollars to ship with the United States Postal Service. I emailed the contact to see if he'd be able to ship my books. He agreed. Armed with hiking backpack and push bike, I scoured Reno and Carson City for deals. I found classic and modern literary fiction from all over the world. Nigeria, the US, Wales, Greece, Kenya, India, Russia, Peru, France, Cuba, Portugal, and more. I came across and bought works in Spanish by Ernesto Sabato, Mario Vargas Llosa, and Isabel Allende. Las Vegas's smaller and poorer Nevada cousin, Reno, was flooded with street sleepers and broken-hearted rogues. However, its proximity to Lake Tahoe in San Francisco, its taco trucks, warm weather, sufficient cycling lanes, Sierra Nevada lager on tap, and the Truckee River made it a desirable place to stay put. Grassroots books held bag sales for $5.00. There was no volume limit, so I ensured I had the largest bags possible. I'd need to expand my catalogue, for I could no longer only sell books I'd read myself. But I didn't want to sell books about crime, murder mysteries, sexually frustrated housewives or dragons. I wanted to get books that would help people feel and encourage them to think critically. I delved into progressive non-fiction, written by the likes of Naomi Klein, Oliver Sacks, Jared Diamond, Slavo Zizek, John Pilger, Frederick Douglass, Noam Chomsky, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Frederick Nietzsche, Mary Wollstonecraft, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, and Malcolm Gladwell. The esoteric self-help books of Deepak Chopra, Dan Millman, Marianne Williamson, Rhonda Byrne, Alan Watts, Robert Bly, Carlos Castaneda, and Don Miguel Ruiz. Regarding domestic shipping from Reno to Los Angeles, I could fill boxes with a weight limit of 70 pounds, 31.75 kilograms, and send them to Los Angeles via media mail for US $30. At a maximum of about one kilo per three books, I could fit a minimum of 90 books per box. I sent six boxes of books. My overhead in New Zealand dollars approximately 75 cents US to one New Zealand dollar at the time, was as follows. 540 books purchased via filler bag sales and 25 selections, less than $130.50. Six boxes posted domestically via media mail from Reno to Los Angeles, $180. Six boxes shipped from Los Angeles to New Zealand, New Zealand $600. US $130.50 plus $180 equals New Zealand. $310.50 divided by 75 cents equals $413 plus international shipping fee $600. Total $1,013 per 540 books. While the books were en route over the Pacific Ocean, I attended my friend's wedding in Mexico. My father would pick up the boxes from the exporter's house and my mother kindly volunteered to post my books within New Zealand. I would need to sell just under 170 books at $6 to pay off my overhead. Back in New Zealand, I was fetching over $10 for in-demand fiction authors Charles Bukowski, Kurt Vonnegut Jr., Jack Kerouac, Sylvia Plath, George Orwell, Toni Morrison and Aldous Huxley. I had a dozen Eckhart Tolle books that all sold for over $20. Christmas week saw record sales, a total of 132 books. A mint condition copy of Sarah Gruen's Water for Elephants 
which was listed at $7, sold for $28. Years later, Ratana Revisited by Keith Newman, sold for $78. It cost me 50 cents per hour to log into a computer at an internet cafe in Guatemala, where I'd communicate with buyers and do my accounting. My profit allowed me to stay on the American continent for half a year and purchase a return ticket home. For a few months, I continued buying books from op shops. I attended book fairs in Auckland, Hamilton and Tauranga, and took in odd jobs such as water blasting and helping a friend with landscaping. I returned to the United States, bought a cheap all-you-can-travel Greyhound bus pass, and made my way through thrift stores and estate sales in neighborhoods in Los Angeles, San Diego, Farmington, Durango, New Orleans, New York City, and Grand Rapids. I was spoilt by the kindness and generosity of U.S. locals, who backed my idea and drove me around these towns in exchange for little payment, often just gas compensation, lunch, and a round or two of beer at day's end. Once again, I shipped books home and headed south of the U.S. border, living off sales. I bought bulk stock at low prices from alcoholic expatriate booksellers in San Pedro, La Laguna, and Panajachel in Guatemala. In 2012, I moved to Melbourne and continued to buy books. In hindsight, I should have sold in Australia, but I wanted to maintain momentum with my New Zealand shop, and I shipped all my books across the Tasman. In 2013, I once more travelled to the US and was employed by the National Park Service of Yosemite in California. Every couple of weeks, I'd hitchhike to my friend Darren's Reno apartment and spend a weekend book hunting and shipping boxes home. At season's end, I went down to Mexico and divided my time between Isla Mujeres, Isla Holbosch, and Merida while selling books. Alas, sales had dropped massively. My Christmas week 132 book sale from 2010 three years on was a mere 18 sales. I returned to New Zealand. Many factors contributed to a drop in sales from the popularity of Amazon Kindle, shortened attention spans, lack of space, declining interest in literature. I'd be unable to pinpoint which of these factors made the greatest impact. I would have to expand my catalogue, so I started selling fantasy books by authors such as George R. R. Martin, Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman, J.K. Rowling, Ursula Gwynn, Philip Pullman, Martin Miller, and J.R.R. Tolkien, as well as modern science fiction novels by Hugh Howie, M. R. Carey, Neil Stevenson, Andy Weir, and N. M. Banks. I also expanded my New Zealand fiction catalogue. Most titles lingered on the shelves for many months, some never leaving them. Authors to disappear quickly were Fiona Kidman, Witi Ihamaira, Nikki Pellegrino, Eleanor Catton, Kerry Holm, Patricia Grace, Janet Frame, C.K. Stead, and Catherine Mansfield. There are many new and heavily promoted fiction writers within New Zealand, but I never came across their books secondhand and therefore didn't sell them. Today, I make a trickly stream of passive income selling books online in Norway. I still sell books online in New Zealand at a discount price. My parents are getting older, so I'd rather rid my stock than have it linger. At the time of writing, I have about 120 left. I've sold about 10,000 books over 10 years. I thrived on the process of seeking, buying, and distributing books, but in recent years, I've become ambivalent. I've noticed that fewer buyers wish to talk books, or talk at all. People attempt to haggle more or can't understand the postage cost calculations, and I get blamed for slow postage. When I asked a friend of mine, a lecturer at a New Zealand university, if he had noticed a decline in reading, he had this to say. Overall, there's tremendously little from people in New Zealand encouraging others to read. If a politician was to do that, I guess they'd have to acknowledge that we don't read as much. While The Catcher in the Rye was fun to teach, students don't read anymore. Courses that used to have eight or nine novels now only have two, with a sprinkling of films and poems instead. Even then, 
This social media generation won't read. Furthermore, the films they watch apparently aren't stimulating enough, so they have to look at their phones at the same time. I sound like a real old man at a park bench yelling at pigeons, but I'm saddened by all this. I had one student come up to me after a tutorial and explain that he's finding the course difficult because he can't read much. Strangely, this student is a solid A plus dude. He wanted to read Moby Dick but gave up, realizing that he can't remember a time before social media and that his brain isn't wired to process and store large amounts of information anymore.